filled with the Spirit. But what did it say before that? Neither be drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit. Coalition between the two. Paul was saying there's something to this. I remember getting drunk in the Holy Ghost. Felt like I had the victory over every sin I'd ever committed and I'm so full of the Holy Ghost the devil couldn't touch me. Till tomorrow. And I would fight some of the same things over and over again but I've come to realize that it wasn't just me but it is the devil's plan for every young person that there will be things in your life that you will fight today and you will fight tomorrow. And I will tell you that if you don't fight them on a daily basis, they will take over your life and you will fall to sin. If you don't learn how to fight the Amalekites and fight them on a daily basis, uh, you'll never possess heaven. All right, I, I'm, I'm moving on. I, I got something to say. I really do. I, I know all this really ain't much, but there's something God God wants me to speak. You 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 know the story when when Ruth followed Naomi home from Moab. One of the most beautiful scriptures, and and most of us, a lot of us, probably have it hanging on our wall somewhere. How that Ruth talked about, I want your people to be my people, and. I want your God to be my God. I, she, was, she was letting Naomi know, I am connecting to you. And you're my teacher. You're my example. I want your God like you want your God. Thank God for some Naomi's that still want what God's got for them. Thank God for some that, that our young people can look up to and say, I want your God to be my God. I want to learn how to pray like you pray. I want to learn how to witness like you witness. I want to learn how to worship like you worship. I don't know if you feel this way, please forgive me, but I gotta, I've got to change your thinking. If you're 40 or 50 years old or older and you feel like you've lived your life for God, all I need to do is show up. You're badly mistaken. For as much as your physical body will allow you, you've got teenagers that are looking up to you. They want to be like you. Ruth, Naomi is trying to teach her. She's trying to guide her. Comes time where this man Boaz has entered the picture. And uh, Naomi ain't no dummy. She knew that Boaz was available. And he was a good man. He was, he was of the right family. He had, the, he had, he had some, some wealth. And, and, and so Naomi understood. And, and Ruth had already expressed, you know, something about this man Boaz to her. I'm sure in their little private conversations, how women do, they get to talking, you know. What, I won't get into that because I don't know what y'all say. Maybe. But Naomi tells Ruth something. One thing that I pull from what their conversation was that absolutely has been strength to me. When Naomi talked to Ruth about meeting Boaz, she makes a statement. And I know for a fact that what she says is not a statement of a literal thing. But it goes far beyond the literal words that were spoken. Naomi says to Ruth, in preparation to meet Boaz, she said, Ruth... You need to wash your face. Naomi told her, wash your face. If you're ever going to get where you're going, I told you now washing your face, I don't believe that Ruth just had a little grease on her face.
face. I, I don't believe she had some food left on there that, that she was trying to keep her from being embarrassed about. I don't believe that was it. There's something far deeper than that because washing your face in the Old Testament went further than just wiping something off of it, you know. Ruth was trying to tell her something. She was trying to tell her that if you're ever going to get Moab out of your life, understand Ruth is a Moabite. She's not an Israelite. She came from a heathen worship, worshiping family. That group of people, they didn't worship the one true God. But I'm thank God for, their, for some people that have come out of false doctrine, that have latched on to some of us that have the true doctrine. But what we've got to learn to do in coming out of that and into this is we've got to learn if we're ever going to get where we're going, we've got to learn to get over where we've been. Ruth, you've had some bad situations. You've had some faults and failures, some hurts in your life. Naomi was saying, you're not ready for Boaz if you still got Moab on your face. <laughs> Issues from the past still clinging to you. I told you I felt like God wanted me to preach to the church. That does not mean somebody can't receive the Holy Ghost. That doesn't mean somebody can't still be baptized in Jesus' name. But church better hear what I'm telling you. We're living in the last days. We're almost ready to possess the promised land. Issues of the past still clinging to you. Now that you're grown, now that you're more matured, understand nobody should be able to look at you now and see the past on your face. Preacher, you don't know what I've been through. You don't know the, you, you don't know the, the, the abuse I've taken. I understand that. I do understand that. But I'm talking about you're serving a God right now that can take the abuse of your past and make it something where it doesn't show on your face. Whenever you see somebody and you witness to them, they may never know what you've been through. It's possible, it is possible to be delivered from something but still have not washed the effects of it out of your life. The church as a whole, most of us have gotten the victory over our past. But those Amalekites are a constant battle. There's somebody that we're constantly having to fight. We're, 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 we're progressing, but we've got to understand there needs to be a washing of the face, meaning that we're going to separate ourselves from what we once were and what I once did, what I once went through is not going to affect me going forward. So what about Og? What about Og? He is king of Bashan. What's so important to have mentioned his name when most of the others were relegated to being known as the children of Anak? Not all the other giants' names were given. Well, I started a little research to find out what about Og. And I find a few things that I'll share with you. But first I must tell you that human beings, man and woman, we are wired to worship something. I, it really doesn't matter what you call yourself, whether you call yourself a, a Christian or a Buddhist or a, uh, you know, it, it doesn't matter your, what you claim is your religion. Even those that claim themselves to be agnostic or atheist, human beings are internally, we are wired to worship. It's amazing. You have folks that, that quit going to church. And when they quit going to church, you can look at their life from a distance. 
and you can still see worship involved. It just involves things. Okay, now I'm, now I'm getting ready to preach to the church, all right? In Bashan, the land of King Og was the first place that the Israelites picked up a false god called Ashtaroth. You read through your Bible, you'll find many places where the man of God commands them. He tells them to put away their strange gods of Ashtaroth and Balaam or Baal. Ashtaroth was the female counterpart of the god Baal. The same God that the prophet had trouble with and, and, and had, had all of these, these prophets of Baal and he uh, set up the challenge, you know, which God answers by. It's the same God, just a little different time. But Ashtaroth was a goddess that Israel picked up. And they picked it up from Og, king of Bashan. I said man is wired to worship. We will always worship something. You and I cannot live without worship. We will worship something. You say, well, I don't worship anything. Listen to your conversations and see what you talk about most of the time. And whatever it is you talk about more than anything else, that's what you worship. We are a creature that is most of us probably right behind me because I may be the first one in line. We are a creature that has very little patience. We want what we want. We want it now. And it's not enough for you to tell us that we can have it. We must have it in our hands. It must be tangible. It must be Something we can feel. It must be something we can see with our own eyes. It's not, it's not just enough for us to know that we can have this or that, you know. Uh, and it'll come to you one of these days. No, that's, that's not, you know, y'all know how we are. You ever get your mind set on something? Uh, some of you young people, uh, parents said amen. They get their mind set on something and you say, yeah, maybe for your birthday you can have one of those. But, but mom... But dad, you know, it's, it's, we are impatient for these things. Children of Israel are no different. There are many instances, but this is just one of the many. After turning their back on the one true God, which they did many times, they began traveling through Bashan where Og was king. And as they walked through the streets of that city, it had been a long time since they felt the presence of the Lord. Why? The Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 7, verses number 2 through 5, and it came to pass while the ark abode in Kirith Jerim, that the time was long. It for it was 20 years. The ark of God has been stolen off the battlefield. And the ark has been gone from the children of Israel for a long time. It's been 20 years. I have trouble sometimes making it from Sunday to Sunday. But can you imagine going 20 years without the tangible, feelable, Sensing the presence of Almighty God. 20 years they didn't stay in one place. They were still marching on. And as they're going along. And the Bible talked about that they had picked up this God Ashtaroth. 20 years is a long time to go without something to worship. They understood and realized how that the one true God was to make them feel when they worship. Now at the point they're at, they may have tried to worship, but it just wasn't the same. There was, there was something wrong because the Spirit of God didn't dwell with them as in the Ark of the Covenant as it used to. 
So somebody had a bright idea while going through Bashan and said, you know what? They worship this God, Ashtaroth. We could, we could just, I mean, it's been a long time since we've had, you know, a, a God we could feel. We could just kind of get a few of these because they were, you know, there's a lot of them. They made, they made lots of them. And I did just a little bit of research to find out that this Ashtaroth actually there was a certain little idol god called Ashtaroth that was a localized god. In other words, it was meant for people to pick it up, take it to a different part of the country where they lived, and make it their own. They could take it, and 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 you know the, the little probably the little pamphlet that came with it told about about the, the Ashtaroth, the god. But they, this this little god, they could take it with them, and they could. Could, could cater it and tailor make it into their own lifestyle. So Ashtaroth is not just one idol that's set up in Bashan and everybody worships it there. They had little gods of Ashtaroth made up and so people could buy one at the, at the little market down there and you could take it and if you wanted to worship that god at 8 o'clock in the morning, you worshiped it at 8 o'clock. There was no rules and regulations and restrictions about worshiping this goddess Ashtaroth. As, now you understand, the, the Israelites, they were used to Jehovah Jehovah, and there were some order in how you did things. You worshipped him at this time, and, and, and on this day you did this. Oh, at this point you did this. You did not do this. Uh, you had this to worry about. You had to make sure your lamb was perfect. There were things that were in line, regulations that, that you know, all it is tough. To be honest with you, there's a lot of work worshiping the one true God. Oh, but this Ashtaroth, man, this was so tempting. Why? Because if I don't, if I don't want to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning, I can sleep in and I can worship my little God whenever I want to. I don't have to worry about having a, a, a sacrifice brought at this time. I don't have to worry about marking dates on my calendar because it says right here, this God can be localized. What about Og? When Samuel comes on the scene, it had been 20 years, and he says, as probably many other times it's been said, if ye do return to the Lord with all your hearts and put away your strange gods of Ashtaroth from among you, prepare your hearts and serve him only, the Lord serve him only, he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm coming, I see the runway. Let me just put it that way. I see the runway. It's a little rainy outside. Sometimes we have to circle around for extra landing, you know. What had happened with the children of Israelites was they had become content with a substitute God. Ashtaroth was a substitute for the true God that they should have been worshiping. They had become satisfied with the physicality of the idol over the true presence of God Almighty. Israel's comfort of making a God fit into whatever they wanted it to fit into became enticing. You know, we're, we're, talking, we're talking God's little G. We're talking about worshiping idols. We're talking about all that. And that's where your mind's at. But can I tell you where Israel stood physically? We stand spiritually. What God told me to tell this church was you need to be careful that things in your life don't become substitutes for feeling the true presence of God. Uh, 
Oh, I'd like to feel what I felt 20 years ago when I got the Holy Ghost. But if I do that, I'm going to have to go down there to that altar on Sunday or Sunday night and everybody's going to be around me. My hair's going to get all messed up. My clothes are going to get all wrinkled up. I'm liable to be thought that I'm a sinner, that I've backslid. I'm going to have to go through and endure all of that. It's much easier for me just to spend time with my bass boat. Oh, don't think that I'm preaching against bass boats. I'm not. It's just much easier for me to get my golf clubs out and go play around the golf. I can spend four hours on the golf course and five minutes in the prayer room Because it's much more comfortable. It's so much easier. I can fit golf into wherever. You can't just pray just anywhere. Y'all, I'm not preaching against golf. I got golf clubs. Somewhere. Trying to think where they are. I'm going to get them out. And we go out there and play golf and enjoy ourselves. I'm not preaching against that. What I am saying is, God is telling me to tell the church, don't become satisfied with a substitute. Don't get satisfied with the things of this world. Ah. Uh, can I, can, I ask you, can I ask you another favor? Let's don't become satisfied with the performance of religious duties over a true relationship. I know, I know how we think. I thought the same thing until God slapped me down when I was studying for this. I thought the same thing. The only people we think have rituals in their religion are people who worship other gods and then there's a couple of denominations that kind of use a lot of rituals. We think of the other denominations and we won't call out names, but they go through a lot of rituals, you know, up and down and they pray to certain people and stuff. The, 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 the gods of this world, idol gods, Baal, you know, not just Baal in the Old Testament, but now we've got Muhammad and we've got uh, Allah and we've got uh, Buddha and, and, and all of these other gods. They go through a lot of, a lot of rituals, you know, a lot of rituals. And, and, and we have a tendency to think that we apostolic Pentecostal folks, we're about the only ones. We ain't got no rituals. Whoop, 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 whoop. God began to deal with me, and he showed me a few of our rituals. You may, you may show you a few of them? Here's one of them. A little half-mast raising of the hand so the pastor don't think you're backslid. Because if I do this along with what everybody else is doing as a general glance across the congregation, if God don't call me out and speak to me, speak to you about me, you know, I... And you know what? This, we've become satisfied with this. When what we really need is is being overtaken by the Holy Ghost and speaking in tongues uncontrollably and we can't even speak English. Here's another, here's another ritual. Golf clap for Jesus. Golf clap for Jesus. There's a good time for a golf clap, but it's only at golf courses and stuff. And you know what? We've we've substituted this for true, heartfelt, give it everything I've got worship so when I leave here, I'm more tired than I was when I walked in. 
Oh, your pastor said it earlier. He said no more church as usual. That's when God confirmed to me I have to say what I'm saying. What about Og? If you stay around Og long enough, you'll try to find a way to make your God fit your life. There's a danger of being satisfied with a substitute. I'm, I'm, I'm nervous. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm nervous. Not because of being, I'm, I'm, God's making me nervous. The Word of God is stirring me up. The Word of God is stirring me up within the past few weeks. God has begun to minister to me. And he's told me, he said, when you go preach, you tell the church. They need to put away their gods of Ashtaroth. You know which ones I'm talking about. The gods that you picked up in the land of Og. The ones that make you feel comfortable with your life. Sorry, but if you can't, if you don't feel conviction like you used to, you've gotten too comfortable with Ashtaroth. If you can't come into a Holy Ghost prayer meeting and begin to feel God talk to your heart and speak to your mind and say, hey, you're spending a little too much time with that and not enough time with me, I, I'm not even going to go to the place where we're talking about actual sins. God said you better be careful not to get satisfied with a substitute because I'm going to tell you what's going to happen you're going to be satisfied and you're going to feel like everything's going fine and the trumpet's going to sound and there are going to be those of us that everybody thought was ready to go those of us sitting on church pews right now that if we had been asked we would have wrote their name down and said yes sir they'll go when the rapture takes place I don't think we understand that according to the Bible only about half of the church folks are going to make it look at the ten virgins you know I used to look at that being that the five were wise and five were foolish the five foolish ones man they were they were sinful what oh right God spoke to me and corrected me and said nope they were virgins too what'd that mean they had lived their life to that point according to the word of God you know what made those five be lost? They got comfortable with how much oil they had in their lamp and they thought I got plenty of time. Is this all right? God. I don't like preaching like this. I don't. As an evangelist, I'd rather be reaching for sinners but God spoke to me. I felt it very strong. And he told me to tell you some things. I don't know this church. I've been here one time. So you can't accuse me of being here and seeing a bunch of folks and knowing what they do. Your pastor and I didn't get to talk yesterday. We both pulled into the church at 11 o'clock p.m. last night or right about there. He drove me down and unlocked the thing and that's it. That's, that's all we've talked about. So if I'm off. If I'm off my rocker and I'm not nowhere near what I need to be, your pastor, I know he's man enough to straighten it up. I, I, I pray to God that I'm just preaching a word of warning, that this is not an issue with anybody. I pray that maybe, maybe just, just maybe that somebody will go, you know what, i got to be careful. i got to tighten up a little bit. i got to make sure this doesn't happen. If that's the way, thank God for it. But we have become satisfied with a substitute. A substitute that we have localized and made our very own. We've made it to where we can worship it when we want to. We can stick it in the closet when we want to. When folks come over and we don't want nobody to know that we do it, we put it over here. Y'all know. When the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of King Solomon, the Bible said she came a long ways 
to see Solomon in all of his glory. Solomon's royal visitor, the Queen of Sheba, she told of some things. One of the things that King Solomon did, we know that the house of God was very important to King Solomon. He wanted to build the, the temple. He, he did it in such a way that there was no, no expense spared. He, he wanted to make sure that the house of God was made correctly and, and he did such a great job of it. But a lot of times we don't talk about the outside part. The Bible said that King Solomon... In 2 Chronicles, he made 300 shields of gold. And the 300 shields of gold, if I'm not mistaken, they were about uh, they were made of about 200 shekels of gold each. And these 300 shields, I, I'm, I'm cutting it in half and assuming 150 on one side and 150 on the other. And he put these shields up on poles. So that they would be visible to everybody. And these shields lined the path where Solomon would make his way into the temple. If at first glance you think that Solomon is being boastful, ostentatious, he just wants to show off what he's got. Solomon had a totally different reason for putting these shields out there. Because the queen of Sheba noted how he went up to the temple. That he went up and as he went up he went between these 300 shields of gold. Solomon's Solomon's message to the people, to anyone who saw it, was that going up to the temple is an important, important thing. It's not something that should be taken lightly. And oh my God, am I not guilty and are you not guilty at times of taking going to the house of the Lord as being just another thing we do. It's just Sunday morning. It's just Sunday night. We just always go here. My God, when you're brushing your teeth, you ought to be praying and saying, God, this is not just going to be another visit to the house of God. When you're putting on your suit, you ought to be thinking, my God, this is going to be something else. I'm go- This is important. I'm- I don't want this to just become a ritual or routine. I can't substitute it. He goes up to the temple but during a battle the Bible said that those 300 shekels of gold are stolen by an Egyptian army. And here's where we have to be careful. It's Rehoboam Solomon's son who comes on the scene after Solomon's death. The Bible said that Rehoboam made 300 shields of brass. He didn't want to put out the money to make the brass shields gold. He was satisfied with a lookalike. Because from a distance, if brass has been polished and shined, it can look like gold from a distance. But you understand that pure gold, they say, does not tarnish. It must have been a constant job of Rehoboam's men to get up there and and brasso them. (laughs) Shields of brass, you know. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Brasso is what you clean it with. And I used to be a drummer, and that's what we cleaned them cymbals with. Use brasso on them. Make them shine again, you know. Polish them. Why would Rehoboam put up 300 shields of brass? He wanted it to appear as though he had the same desires as his father. Yet through his life, it's very obvious that it was not as important to go to the house of God for Rehoboam as it was to go for Solomon. What about Og? And I'm closing with the musicians coming. All of these things were results of settling for a substitute God.
there's a there's a spirit of God that's in this place that's reaching for not just those who have never received the Holy Ghost, but it's reaching for those of us that have been around this thing for a long time. What about, uh, well, behind the Israelites, the land is littered with the grotesque bodies of defeated giants. Bondages have been broken, chains have been snapped. The desert, the thirst, and the hunger are behind them. And it seems that there's only one thing left. Only Og. The Bible said. If the word of God saw fit to speak so directly about King Og. Since he's the last giant. What is so important about Og? I've already told you a little little bit. In the things that I've delved into. But why? What's written about Og? Brother Huntley did such a fine job of preaching a message on The last giant before Canaan, I believe it was, was the title of his message. But if the word of God saw fit to mention Og, what 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 are the characteristics of Og, you know? The Bible doesn't mention his mighty men, it doesn't mention his army. His portfolio is basically empty because there, there is nothing stated about Og. That we would have looked for. We would think that it would be a list of his victories. His accomplishments. Maybe buildings he had built. Whatever. You look for those things you know. But the only thing the word of God says about Og. Is that it described him like this. His bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Nine cubits was the length thereof and four cubits was the breadth. According to calculations, his bed was approximately nine foot wide and 18 foot foot long. The scripture does not mention the number of warriors at his disposal, the number of chariots, the skill of his commanders, not even his previous astounding successes. All the Bible wanted us to know about King Og was he had a king-sized bed. (laughs) If Og is really the last giant that we're going to face, if Og is the the last thing we got to deal with, could it be that God is telling us That the church has to beware of a spirit of slumber and sleep. If that's all that's mentioned, could it be that God is saying, be careful and don't get comfortable? I was listening to preaching and reading the word of God yesterday and the scripture where Hannah was praying for a child. The Bible said that she was grieved, she was vexed. It gave us very clear understanding that she was not happy. She was irritated. She was aggravated. You could just keep listing words to that, I'm sure. And Elkanah comes to her. You understand Hannah's not, she had not had any children. No, 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 no babies born to Hannah, but Peninnah has given birth to children. You don't hear Peninnah whining, crying, frustrated, aggravated, 
But Hannah, she's in that agitated state. And I thought whenever I read that Elkanah asked her, he said, the Bible said he gave her a worthy portion. To everybody he gave a portion, but to her he gave a worthy portion. I thought whenever I read that Elkanah said to Hannah, said, am I not better to you than ten sons? I thought, Elkanah, you're an idiot. I don't mean to, but but you understand what I'm saying. Looking at a woman in that state of mind, knowing why she's in that state of mind. He showed he didn't know much about women. Some of you men know, I know, there are certain times and certain circumstances have gone on in our life that I don't ask my wife certain questions. I'm smarter than the average bear. It's the truth. But do you understand, here's what I saw in this. The church needs to be aggravated, upset, agitated, irritated, all the other aided. When we're not baptizing people in Jesus' name and seeing them filled with the Holy Ghost, the church ought to be frustrated. Rather than sitting at the table enjoying the portion that God's given us, Hey, we cannot just be satisfied with what we've had back there. You know, the church that's growing is an agitated, irritated church. You know, I'm not talking about agitated and irritated at everything. I'm just talking about because they're not baptizing somebody in Jesus' name on a constant basis. People aren't being filled with the Holy Ghost. Would you stand? greatest need that the church has today is spiritual desperation we cannot afford to substitute satisfaction for desperation we need to be careful not to substitute complacency for spiritual hunger we can't substitute the performance of religious duties such as coming to church lifting our hands and clapping We can't substitute that for true connection with the Father. I firmly believe this. And I know that the devil is against the church and he fights the church. But since the Bible said that if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then will I hear from heaven forgive their sins and will heal their land the the contingency here is only on the people so if the people can bring true revival to a city then only the people can hinder it I fear fear being a smart aleck when I say this, but please don't take it this way. There is no need for us to walk these aisles and pray against the devil and have it praying that the devil wouldn't stop revival. That's a useless prayer. Because the devil can't stop revival. Only you and I can stop revival. Now, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not against praying against the enemy and praying against, you know, him, him uh, con, con, confusing a sinner's mind or, or, you know, the things that he, that please do, go, you know, attack the devil on that front. But there's no reason in the world for us to go around praying that God would stop the devil from hindering revival because the devil can't hinder it. You know, the only thing that's going to hinder it is if my people 
which are called by my name shall not humble themselves if we don't pray, if we don't seek his face and turn from our wicked ways. That's what's hindering revival. What about Og? These altars are open right now. I believe today would be a great time for somebody that's never received the gift of the Holy Ghost to receive it. But I also believe that these altars ought to be full of people that just want to make another stand for God. Just another statement to God. God, don't let me get satisfied. God, break me out of the of the normal break me out of the situation I, I've, I've gotten into a habit of living right living right's a good habit to get into but it ain't good to just live right out of habit God make us intentional God make us do the things we do on purpose
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I know me dismissing is the only thing keeping you from lunch, so I'll be quick. I want every man's attention. Every man. I'll even accept a boy's attention right now. Women have a very, very strict outward appearance on how they have to approach God in the Bible. There's a very, I mean, in our day, it's very strict. You know, we think of it as strict. There's certain ways. Modesty has to be there for both sexes. But there's certain ways that women have to be, have to be uh, separated. They have to have their hair uncut, whether it's long or not. It, it can't be cut. And, and, and they have to make sure that they don't put on Makeup, because there should be shamefacedness, and there should be a, a matter of purity. It's quiet in this house, but we do still believe that, right? But men, listen to me. There's a certain way we have to approach God. And that is, we have to be able to lift up holy hands without wrath or doubting. We do. That means if you have a temper at home, you better pray it through for you get the house of God. Because you can't lift up holy hands. 
That means if you cussed your wife out on the way to church, you better get in the prayer room when you get to the house of God because you can't lift up holy hands. Hallelujah. In fact, I would go so far as to tell you that men have the most strict standard in the Bible because ours cannot be seen on the outside. It's seen on the inside. And many of us, if our wives walked in looking like a Jezebel, we would be so upset. We'd tell her how she needs to get saved. But we have no problem walking around like some kind of idiot, running our mouths and cussing each other out and talking on each other down and having a temper all over this place. Hey, it's quiet and it's tight, but it is right. And the fact is, is that our holiness is more important to God than even her holiness. Because she has to follow us. So God's very concerned about us. Because if we're not folding up the holy example before her, she can't live a holy life. Because she don't know how to walk right. Because you're the leader of your house. That's good teaching. Thank you, Pastor, for preaching that way to me. You're welcome. I will. I'm going to tell you, that's the facts. And even though we don't like to admit it, all of us need a good old-fashioned dose of getting some idols out of our lives. And men, for some reason, the biggest idol they have a problem with is self. Let's tie it again. I got like five people saying, that's right, that's the truth. Brother Murphy and Bishop say amen to me. Brother Bert's backing me. The rest of you are quiet in here. Listen to me. We got to get rid of our self-will. Sacrificing ourself. Amen. Sometimes that's our hardest thing. Women, uh, they give a lot. Amen. Men have to learn to be willing to get rid of self. Amen. What a good message today. Thank you, Brother Murphy, for preaching to us what God is speaking and not just trying to impress it's easier to go into a church when you haven't seen them in a while and just preach a fluffy sermon because that that gets you friends everybody comes up because they like it when you are screaming and yelling and shing, swinging from the chandeliers we throw our chandeliers down bishop said get don't put them back up after we had last camp i said okay so we we kept them down so we don't have nothing to swing from anymore hallelujah but that's what we like. We like that kind of preaching. Amen. We like that. But what we need is change preaching, changing. Amen. All right. I've taken too much of your time already. Tonight, somebody say tonight. Tonight, we're going to be back in the house of the Lord. And uh, our, our evangelist will be back here with us. And it is back to school service. And uh, if nothing changes, we're going to be having a great time in the Lord tonight. Amen. Praise God. I think Larissa, if nothing's changed, is getting baptized tonight in Jesus' name. We're so thankful for about that. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. So we're going to have a great time tonight. Back to school service. I can't stress enough, Mom and Dad, Grandma and Grandpa, to be here. Help us pray for these young people. And be a part of their life in this back to school service. Amen. Our kids, whether they're going to a Christian school or not, doesn't matter. Our kids need our prayers. But more than ever, amen, our kids in public school need our prayers. Hallelujah. They need God to be with them big time. Amen. This inclusivity thing has got me riled up. Hallelujah. I'm in my prayer closet a little bit longer because of that thing. And uh, we're just going to pray that God's protecting hand will be on them and that they can serve the Lord in this hour. Amen. Where they're at. In Jesus' name. And Brother Murphy will be preaching again tonight. We're just going to have a great time in the Lord. Come back expecting great things. Will you stand in this house today? We're going to give them to the Lord. Amen. As uh, it is our custom to do, we bring our tithe into the storehouse and our building fund. Amen. Into the storehouse. Amen. That we might be able to continue building this building. Praise the Lord. And our offerings and our missions offering, if you have it to give today, I know some of you like to give randomly. Amen. This isn't Mission Sunday, but if you have it to give, you're welcome to drop it off in the tithe or in the missions box here. And uh, we'll just... Make sure that we 
give it to the missionaries. We love our missionaries. Love our missionaries. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. I wish some of these young people would hear me right now uh, and get a burden for a missionary. And uh, just ask God, God, what can I do from Danville? What can I do here in Danville to help somebody out in the kingdom of God? And uh, God will lead us if we'll ask sincerely. Amen. But we're going to do that right now. Sister Abby's going to lead us today. She's going to march. And uh, her and Sister Summer's going to lead us off. I'm asking everybody to march and give unto the Lord. She's going to lead as soon as the music starts. And then we'll do center section. And then, amen, we'll do this west side over here. Amen. As we give unto the Lord. Amen. Go ahead, Sister Abby. Lead us off. Oh! 